so uh, we have looked at the <coughs> rules that we have to obey when we are using fermions or bosons. We have to properly symmetrize or anti-symmetrize the wave functions. And <coughs> that basically means that if we are uh, working with electrons with two spin states, we have to figure, we have to calculate uh, two particles per state when we are putting particles into those states. So we are still working with identical particles, uh, but we'll discuss what happens when we have a bunch of non-interacting electrons. So these are electrons which do not feel one another in the sense that they don't have a potential between them. Uh, but still, the statistics that fermions have to obey restrict how they are distributed to energy levels. Okay, so what we are going to do is we are going to look at a system in which we can define the single particle states and then start putting in electrons into those states one by one and see how the system behaves under those circumstances. Okay, so one the perhaps it's best that we start with the latest problem that we discussed, the problem of the hydrogen atom. Uh, now, if you want to generalize this to larger numbers of electrons, well, we are really then talking about atomic structure, and we have to discuss what the single particle states are uh, for atoms of that kind. Okay, so let's just look at the, <coughs> okay, so uh, we'll still consider the presence of an atomic uh, potential, which means that there is some nucleus and it has a number of protons, obviously, also neutrons, but the neutrons do not enter into the potential game. So I have plus Z times the electronic charge amount of central charge. And then I want to look at single particle state, so it's just like the hydrogen atom. If I have a single electron here, okay, it is going to be an ionized atom because it must mean if it has four protons and just one electron, that means it has lost three of its electrons, okay? But let's just see what that does to our uh, Hamiltonian, single particle Hamiltonian. Well, remember that we had this H equal to uh, minus H bar squared over 2M and then we had the Laplacian, which included everything, uh, the angular momentum and the kinetic energy uh, terms, etc. And then we had this inter, okay, uh, nuclear and electron potential. So it's an attractive potential, and e squared 4 pi epsilon 0 r. Okay, so that was our H. And what did we find? Well, uh, obviously I'm not, I don't want to go through all of the algebra, but what we found out was that this energy was equal to something, okay, minus something E to the four, okay, a lot of something else, n squared. Okay, so that was the type of result that we obtained, okay? And in terms of numerics, this was minus 
13.6 electron volts divided by n squared. Now over here I have a very similar Hamiltonian. Remember I'm looking at the single particle state, so it's going to be h is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m del squared. But instead of e squared, now I have minus z times e squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 r. So I need to go over the whole algebra, just putting a z wherever I see an e squared. And you can sort of guess what happens. The energy, let's call it En, En is going to be equal to minus, okay, the same constants, except that I'm going to get Z e squared squared, because this is, okay, that e to the 4 was generated from an e squared. So that's what that is going to look like. Okay, all of the constants are going to rest of the problem is going to be the same. So this is going to be minus, okay, uh, 13.6 electron volts divided by n squared, okay, multiplied by z squared, where z is the charge, okay, in the uh, charge of the uh, the the number of positive charges in the nucleus. Okay, so. That means if I just have a uh, single particle in uh, helium, so let's start with the uh, simplest atoms. Suppose I have a helium plus ion. So a helium plus ion is a single particle problem. So that's our result should be valid except that I should put z equal to 2, okay? So I am going to get uh, this is equal to minus 13.6 uh, times 4, right? Because z is 2 uh, electron volt over n squared. Okay, so how much is that? Well, let's just multiply, who, is, who multiplies this first, 26, uh, something like 52, right? So uh, <coughs> approximately, uh, okay, 50 electron volts over n squared, the minus sign. Okay, so this is going to be the uh, binding energy of the single electron for the helium plus ion. So that goes into the lowest energy state with n equal to one. Now if I want to put a second electron there, okay, that I can also put to the ground state, okay? So remember, <clears throat> this system has a number of energy states. The lowest one is n equal to one and I can put two electrons here, okay? So and just as a shorthand, we write something like this, but that, what that means is that this is a singlet state. So the spins are really in the zero, zero state, which is one over square root of two, one up, the other one down, minus down up, okay? So the electrons are in this state, and they both go into <clears throat> the lowest energy state. Okay, so in that case, if I have the helium atom, okay, I shouldn't say this is equal to, okay, this is the energy of that. So for the helium atom, which has two electrons, it's twice that. I believe it's something like 108 or something, minus 108 electron volt. I'm not going to put one over n squared there because now, okay, n is not <coughs> well defined. It's n equal to one for both of the electrons, but uh, when I start moving one electron to a different energy level, of course, it's not a single number that's, uh, that's associated with that. Okay, so that's the ground state without 
any interaction between the electrons. So if you look at what the experimental value is, experimental value is around minus 80 electron volts. <coughs> okay, so that means there's something like 20, 30 electron volts of less binding energy because the electrons, the two electrons repel one another, right? So that increases the energy. In fact, they are sitting in this, uh, in this symmetric state. Remember, the spin state state is anti-symmetric, okay? So the space part of the uh, wave function is symmetric, which means that if I look at the, uh, the wave function, it's just going to be u1, uh, 0, 0. Okay, so I'm writing here n, l, uh, m uh, states. Okay, one zero zero of x one times u one zero zero x two. Okay, and these things remember they are zeroth order polynomials with exponential okay decay. So I really have two electrons actually which are sitting on top of one another. Okay, so there is going to be actually a lot of electron-electron repulsion because they just feel one another very strongly and that shows up in the actual experimental value. Okay, so if we want to calculate this, okay, uh, more accurately, obviously we have to put in the electron-electron interaction into the Hamiltonian, okay, and then solve the problem. The problem is when you put the electron-electron interaction in, you can no longer obtain an analytically exact expression. Okay, uh, so we'll have to look at what approximations we can do. Okay, so we can play around with this a little bit. Uh, you can look at the helium atom, but in it's excited states, okay? So still, I have no interaction between the electrons, but I have these energy levels, so let me just draw them over here, okay? So I have a set of energy levels which are actually getting closer to one another as I go up, okay? Because it goes down like one over n squared, so I have something like this. Okay, so this is n equal to 1, n equal to 2, n equal to 3, n equal to 4, etc. until I have at some point here zero energy and it just sort of asymptotically approaches that value as n becomes larger and larger. Okay, so what we have been discussing here is the case when both electrons are in the ground state, so that corresponds to that energy. So let me just uh, make a scale of this, okay? So, uh, so suppose this is my energy, so I'm just sort of make a redrawing that. Okay, so over here I have this energy level, which experimentally, okay, so if this is zero, uh, this is something like minus 80 electron volts, okay? So this corresponds to both particles in the ground state. And it corresponds to a symmetric, okay, uh, space wave function, but anti-symmetric, okay, spin wave function, okay? So spin wave function, I mean this, okay? So I have this condition, and that means that this is the S equal to zero case. 
Now I'm going to move one of the electrons to another energy level. Okay, so if they are both in the same energy level, I cannot escape this uh, anti-symmetric spin wave function. There's no way I can make it symmetric. Okay. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, I could have the opposite. I can have an anti-symmetric okay, space wave function and a symmetric okay, spin wave function. Okay, so these things, the symmetric spin wave functions, remember, are s equal to 1. The total spin now is 1. Okay, so these are the uh, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1 minus 1 states. Okay, now remember that if I have an anti-symmetric wave function, what was the average of x1 minus x2? Was, was it larger than the other case or less than the other case? Less. x1 minus x2? Larger. Larger. larger, right? Okay, because the space wave function is symmetric, so this one has a larger x1 minus x2 squared. So, if I'm now going to put one of these electrons, I take one from the ground state, and suppose I put it over here. Okay? Now I have a choice. I can have the wave function symmetric and the spin wave function anti-symmetric and so on. Okay, so those now bring up those two cases. I cannot, I do not have, for the case of helium, a case when I can move this electron also to an excited state. Because then it becomes too energetic, okay? And as soon as I put a second electron in an excited state, it just falls down and releases enough energy to kick the other one out. Okay, so it becomes an ionized helium. Okay, so there's no stable helium in which both electrons are in uh, an excited state. Okay, so one of the electrons must stay in the ground state so the other one can take a trip around. Okay, but of course we don't know which one is which because they are indistinguishable, right? Okay, so. <laughs> Under those circumstances, for example, uh, okay, so a little bit of terminology. Uh, this is the n equal to 1, okay, and L equal to 0 state, okay? Now, for historical reasons, okay, chemists have renamed these things instead of calling them L equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, they call this one the S state. Okay, and since it's N is equal to 1, this is called the 1S state. Okay, so this is just notation. So L equal to 0, 1, 2, 3 correspond to S, P, D, F type of notation. Okay, so they don't say uh, whatever L equal to 2, they say it's the D orbital. Okay. Just notation. Okay, so it's a one S state has this property. There's no other one and something else state. Okay, because I can have only L equal to zero. Now I can go up to N equal to two. Okay. And have an Again, S equal to zero for the second uh, electron. So I can have L equals zero here. Okay. But I can also have the same thing over here. But which one will have the higher energy? 
in reality, okay? Obviously, according to our calculations, they should be exactly the same, right? So <laughs> this is going to be the anti-symmetric space wave function, symmetric spin wave function, so it's going to be uh, n equal to 2 again, L equal to 0. So I have drawn them equal because if, I, if there's no electron-electron interaction, obviously, this is just, I'm just putting <coughs> one electron here and the second electron there and just symmetrizing or anti-symmetrizing them. But I know that there is Coulomb interaction between the electrons. So if there's a lot of overlap between the electron wave functions, there will be repulsion, okay? So what do I expect here? Which of these things should be have a lower energy? Okay, so anti-symmetric anti space wave function should have a lower energy. So this goes down a little bit lower. Okay, so this is now going to be L equal to zero and equal to two, but S equal to one. Okay, so this, this thing now is uh, still L equal to zero. So this is the two S orbital. Okay, this is also the two S orbital. Okay, and to make a distinction between these two, this type of interaction is associated with what is known as parahelium. And this one is orthohelium. Okay, now the energy difference between these things is relatively small, okay? Uh, so this is minus 80 electron volts, but what I am drawing here is of the order of perhaps a few electron volts. In fact, I'm not going to draw much more. Uh, you can look at all of these energy levels. There's a nice, nicer picture of this in your textbook, probably quantitatively more accurate also. So <clears throat> please look at that. And <coughs> So the, the same argument goes for higher order stuff. Uh, for example, for n equal to, okay, l equal to zero and n equal to three, uh, which is going to be the three s orbitals. Uh, this one will have uh, less of electronic repulsion than l equal to zero and equal to three uh, for the parahelium. Okay, so that's how these things uh, go for excited states of helium. So excited state of helium means one of the electrons is in the ground state, the other one is in an excited state, and then you also <coughs> look at the uh, symmetrization or anti-symmetrization of the wave function to get uh, what you have. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so this is uh, really, uh, we are getting a little bit into atomic physics, which, yes? Why uh, less, less repulsion means uh, more uh, energy? Uh, okay, so the energy here, you see, is developed by this minus sign, okay? That's the attractive potential. That's why we have minus okay, uh, minus energies, okay, that's the bound state. So we need to put energy to the electron in order for it to escape, okay? So that is the energy needed to <coughs> free both of these electrons. Now, if you have electron-electron interaction, that's something which is going to come in as positive, okay? So I am going to get here a term which looks like plus e squared over four pi epsilon zero, okay, R1 minus R2, okay, so this is the energy due to the interaction of two electrons with one another, okay? So that's going to be some positive quantity, 
and it's going to be larger if R1 is closer to R2. Okay, so if there's a much overlap, that's going to be a larger quantity. Okay. Yes. Yeah, probably if you don't understand something, I may have made a mistake. Okay, so this goes up here. Okay, L equal to zero, N equal to three. Okay, so yes. Uh, you said there is no identical solution. Uh, how can you tell when an equation doesn't have an identical solution? Well, if someone finds it, of course, that's an analytical solution. Yes. Better yet, what you can do is, if you are a sufficiently established mathematician, you can say, well, this is the power series expansion or whatever, and this is the, a special function with my name on it. Okay, so the solution to this equation is, I don't know, Hans Beta function or something. <laughs> okay, so if you can just, but obviously for something to be considered an analytical solution, the functions that you are using uh, must be, okay, some sort of uh, established set of functions. So same this thing is true when you write the Bessel's differential equation, okay, and then you say the solutions are Bessel's equations, but what are Bessel's equations? Okay, those are just certain power series which uh, turn out to be useful in lots of places, okay? So again, if you can, uh, find a solution in terms of the functions that we already know, uh, that's we consider an analytical solution. Otherwise, it's going to be some sort of... Uh, can, can you tell the difference beforehand? Or well, I can't. Maybe some good mathematician can, uh, but even then, uh, I doubt it. You probably have to work on it a little bit to see what type of equation it is, what type of singularities it has, et cetera, so that uh, it, whether you can classify it in terms of uh, known uh, types of uh, differential equations. Okay, so let's now uh, start putting in more electrons, okay? So we have this, uh, sets of energies. In fact, we are not going to talk any more quantitatively about them, but I'll just uh, throw this uh, set of energy levels again. And let's look at what happens when I have these neutral atoms, okay, one by one as we go up higher and higher uh, in the uh, electron number. So the simplest thing that I can have is <clears throat> that I can have a single electron in n equal to one, and then I know that it has to go into L equal to zero, and that's it, okay? So <clears throat> that obviously is the hydrogen atom. Now, if you have then a second electron going into it, okay? Then you need two positive charges in the nucleus, okay? That's what we call the helium uh, atom. Now, that means the electron will go to the lowest energy level, which is going to be n equal to one, L equal to zero again, okay? But now the spin part is going to be Okay, uh, the, for this, for both of them to go in there, okay, it has to be, uh, the, the spin part has to be uh, the, uh, okay, space part is going to be symmetric, so spin part is going to be anti-symmetric, so it's going to be an S equal to zero state. Okay, so this is now, if I just look at what Z is, so this is Z equal to one, this is z equal to two. Now, what happens whenever, when, okay, when you do this, especially for small n, is that when you complete this n, you see this is n equal to one in both cases, we just discussed this, they are nice symmetric functions. 
So they, these two electrons effectively just go around the nucleus. And suppose I want to put another electron. So where do we end up? Lithium, right? So these are uh, the smallest atoms. So they are useful because they can move around in materials because their size is small. That's why we have these lithium batteries, okay? They, it's a small atom that can uh, diffuse through uh, channels and such things. But now, <clears throat> what has happened? I had, if you look at the lithium atom, I have three, okay, positive charges here. And then let me start putting electrons one by one. Okay, so the first two go into the uh, n equal to one state, and they are very nice and symmetrical. Now I cannot put anything else, okay? I cannot put another electron into n equal to one. So the third electron has to go into n equal to two. But from the perspective of the n equal to two electron, which is going to have a larger radius, right? effectively will be farther away from the nucleus, it sees the other electrons as a complete shell. Okay, so it looks like, okay, it looks like there's just a single plus charge there and it becomes almost hydrogenic. Except that, of course, when you have n equal to Two, again, you are going to get an L equal to zero state, which is going to be spherically symmetric, and therefore it will sit on the nucleus. So again, there will be electron-electron interaction. But still, what you can do is you can treat each one of these shells, each one of these ends, as if you have now a spherical object at the center, and then something else on the outside. So that just shows itself in, uh, in, in, in this sequence. So now I have lithium, okay? So that has all the orbitals of helium. So let me use the uh, notation of your book. It has this piece. So there's one, and there are two electrons in L equal to zero okay, in the inner shell, but then I have also, plus in addition to that, I have the n equal to two and l equal to zero, okay, uh, states. So again, there will be two of them, okay, so there will be a single spin state, and then there will be a, okay, double spin state, so that's going to be the next atom beryllium, okay, so that's going to be this helium plus that's going to be n equal to two, L equal to zero again. Okay, so that completes the L equal to zero states, but then I have the L equal to one states that are coming up after that, okay, so you remember what Z equal to five is? Six is carbon. Boron, Boron okay. Uh, so this thing now is this uh, beryllium plus n equal to two, L equal to one state. Okay, so L equal to one now allows you to generate a number of M states. Okay, so M can be one, M can be zero, M can be minus one, okay? So this corresponds to three space states, but each one of them can take two spin states, okay? So if you just multiply these by two possible spin states, there will be a total of six, okay? Six atoms. So <coughs> six there, two there, so that makes 10, right? So 10th is neon. Okay, so this neon has now another 
shell field. Okay, so you have six. Uh, okay, so this this piece is. Okay, so I'm being a little sloppy here. Six atoms like this. Okay, uh, two atoms here. So it makes eight. So two plus eight, uh, I end up with ten. Okay. So we have complete another shell. So this unfortunately doesn't go very systematically like this. Okay, as you go into higher and higher states, uh, you start to fill in higher n numbers before lower n numbers because of this electron-electron interaction. Okay, and the sequence changes. But chemists have found very nice rules. They are called the Hund's rules. Uh, again, your book goes into a little bit more detail in that, in, in which sequence these uh, states are filled, okay? Because when you put in the electron-electron interaction, then things are not going as smoothly as what I have described here, but that's the basic idea, yes? So I couldn't understand the boron case. The which case? Boron, uh, M, M. Okay, it's, so I have, <laughs> I'm now filling in the n equal to 2 states, right? So n equal to 2 states, I have the possibility of having L equal to 0 or L equal to 1, okay? So L equal to 0 and L equal to 1. So as you go up in angular momentum, remember that the average radius becomes larger, right? So you get farther away from the nucleus which means that you are going to uh, be less influenced by this attractive charge, so you are going to be less bound. So th those L equal to one gets filled after L equal to zero. Okay, so you have the, the uh, N equal to two states, which correspond to L equal to zero. So each L equal to zero takes in two electrons. Then you have to go to L equal to one. But L equal to 1, you also have the M index, right? So for L equal to 1, M can be plus 1, 0, or minus 1. Each one of these states can take one electron with upspin and the one in downspin, well, actually, in anti-symmetrized form, okay? So they take six, okay? There are six possible ways that you can fill this. After that, you have to start with n equal to three, okay, states. So n equal to two states correspond to, okay, all of, so if I just write them down, okay, so I have two, so these are n, l, m states. So this is going to be two, uh, one, and a, well, let's start with zero, 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 okay, so two, one, one, two, one, zero, two, one, minus one. Okay, so those are the states. There are four of them, but into each one I can put a, I can associate with two spins, okay, in anti-symmetric form. So it makes eight possibilities, okay? So there are eight, you can put eight, electrons into those orbitals. Each electron that you put in, in order to get a neutral atom, you must also add a proton, okay? So if you have six protons, you, can have, you are going to have six electrons, okay? Which means that out of these things, okay, six of them will be filled, okay? So it corresponds to, the neon corresponds to case when all of these things have two electrons. And since all of these states are orthogonal to one another, okay, orthogonal and complete for n equal to two, these LMs, remember these are the angular parts, they form now a complete set of states. The angular distribution of these things will be very nice and spherically symmetric. That's why we call them a shell. So that's neon now forms the second shell after helium, and then we go to higher energies, okay? 
Any other questions? Yes. How can we explain the extra electrons, negative ions, in this case? Well, uh, you see, the, uh, if I put a another electron into one of those energy states, and if the energy is, if the total energy is still negative, okay, that will be a negative ion. So if I have a <coughs> Okay, so uh, I have these hydrogenic states. Okay, and then I am going to put in uh, electrons into that. Now, if I, for example, put in an electron here, okay, suppose this is the hydrogen potential, okay, then I know that this is minus 13.6 electron volts. Now, if I somehow convince another electron to go in there, that's going to be, what, minus 27 electron volts, right? Now, if the repulsion, okay, energy between these things is less than, okay, that energy, then, okay, this will at least survive for some time. But we have to look at what other possibilities I can have. I can have this electron here and another one there. So that's going to have an even lesser, okay, negative energy, right? If they are both in the lowest energy level, it's going to be the lowest energy, okay? So what I am saying is that I have minus 13.6 electron volts. If I put both electrons into n equal to one and one, so that's going to be one over one plus one over one, that will be the energy associated with the two electrons if there's no repulsion, okay? But I could also put minus 13.6 electron volts, one of them in the ground state, the other one in the n equal to two state, then that will be now the energy of the states. But what I am ignoring the electron-electron interaction. Now, how much the electron-electron interaction will contribute depends on whether this is going to be stable or not, okay? So if this turns out to be positive, that means the electron will be one of the electrons will be kicked out of the atom. But if it's negative, then it means it will survive in that state for some time. Okay, so it depends all on this energetics. Yes? Uh, in chemistry, I remember that there are certain magic numbers that increase and decrease electron uh, infinity, etc. Is it also related with this symmetric and unsymmetric nature of the electrons? Well, yes, chemists have been very successful in constructing various rules for all of these things. I suggest that you look at the problem in your textbook about Hund's rules. Okay, so these are uh, rules uh, about the en this energetics, okay, it's the largest uh, angular momentum state gets filled in first, etc. So uh, you can use these rules to go along the periodic table <coughs> and see which energy levels get filled first, last, and such things. So uh, if you know which electrons go into, okay, which states the electrons go into, then you can make certain statements about uh, how uh, active that atom is going to be, how much its affinity is going to be, and such things, okay? So uh, this is actually uh, quite a uh, useful set of rules, and it also shows you uh, the nature of science. The, uh, you can construct quite efficient and useful rules uh, without having to 
rely upon perhaps the very fundamental rules which they can be derived from. So these things probably can be derived, okay, from quantum mechanics. But it just tells you, for example, that if you are making, if you are working on biology, you don't have to know quantum field theory, right? So there are these rules on how these molecules, you know, react with one another, etc., which are extremely useful. So there is this hierarchical uh, structure, which uh, in which you, you can do science at a certain level, which is based on something uh, which is more fundamental. So it's this layered structure. So you can be a reductionist and say that everything can be explained in terms of quantum mechanics, but it's not practical. Okay, so in practice, we'll leave the details to the chemists. Yes. Also, we are always discussing electrons in this case, but can we also state that uh, in the nucleus, protons and neutrons are also symmetric and unsymmetric in nature, so it also determines their radioactivity in that sense? Well, that's a big jump from symmetry to radioactivity. But the distance between the protons and neutrons, I think it is plausible. Uh, okay, the, uh, you see, the, the uh, force law between the nucleons is somewhat different than Coulomb's. Okay, there's still the Coulomb interaction between the protons, but obviously there must be something, some attractive interaction between them, okay, that's holding them together. Okay, so uh, what happens is that this electromagnetic interaction is mediated by photons which are massless particles. And if they are massless particles, then you can show that these massless particles generate a force which is proportional to one over R squared. Okay, a potential which is proportional to one over R. Now, if you have a mass particle which is mediating a force, okay, so in the case of nucleons, they are the pions, which do have mass, then the attractive force has a certain distance of action. Okay, so if the particles are very close to one another, then they uh, feel the attraction, which is the strong force or strong attraction, stronger than the Coulomb force, so they form a bound state. Now, the bound state, okay, uh, therefore is inside an attractive potential due to this interaction using the pions, so it's as if the nucleus is in a bag, but sometimes if you squeeze too much, too many nucleons into a bag, okay, it doesn't hold that many particles and some of them try to escape, okay, that's what's related to radioactivity, okay, it's not just that a proton all of a sudden leaves it, but there are other things a proton turns into something plus a neutron and then things get different. How close you pack these atoms? Isn't it related with the same particle statistics that we have discussed? Uh, not really. You see, how close we are packing these things, okay, is not uh, related to uh, the uh, to actually the uh, forces, right, between the particles. These are non-interacting particles, so they, these are single particle states, okay? So they, these are single particle states, and then there's also electron-electron interaction. Now, uh, the nucleus problem, the nucleon problem is somewhat different, so there's a nice course on nuclear and particle physics, uh, uh, which you can take as an elective, I guess, and that will be useful. Okay, maybe this is a good place to give a break and then we'll go on.